Hey there, what's going on? It's Dr. Mike T. Nelson here, and I'm talking about metabolic flexibility and intermittent fasting. So how can we use these two concepts, which most people have probably heard of some type of intermittent fasting now, how can we use these in relation to food for both survival and thriving? So I'll explain what the concept of metabolic flexibility is, some info on fasting, and the argument that I'm going to make here is teaching the body to survive better will enable it to thrive, right? So if we're good at both of these things, we're gonna increase our odds of survival and at the same time, in today's modern society, we can increase your body's ability to thrive. So this serves a very cool dual purpose. So uh, thank you to Jessica and everyone for setting this up. Very much big thanks to my wife. This is a picture of my wife and me. So thank you very much to her for all of her help with everything in the business. So usually when we think survival, of course, one of the first things we think about is food, um, which is interesting in today's modern society. We are almost surrounded by food everywhere. So one of the things I do when I teach in person is ask students how long it would take them to go get 300 calories worth of food if I gave them only five dollars and pretty much every place you can think of again there's exceptions it's relatively easy in today's modern society to get food now again we can argue about the nutritional value of this and health consequences and everything else um, but getting food currently it's not really that hard quality other things like that very much uh, debatable. Uh, there's even text that describes something called a food desert, which doesn't necessarily mean that there is no food, just means that higher quality food is less available. So yes, to survive, do we need food? Absolutely. Um, could that potentially become scarce? Absolutely. And I'm going to make a little bit different argument here about how we can use this concept to better prepare our physiology and prepare right now. Because generally, if you talk about food and people preparing, you end up down a whole bunch of crazy websites about the best foods to stockpile and how to create all this stuff. And I think there is some truth to that, and I think that can be useful at a time. But I'm going to argue that the better we can train our physiology right now to be better adapted to what's coming in the future, that, to me, is going to be the best way. So that is also going to teach your body how to thrive better. And this is gonna make you a much more resilient and harder to kill human, which is good. If you're more resilient, your health is gonna be a lot higher. So this is kind of based on the framework of anti-fragile, Nisim Talib. So if I have something and I drop it, right? So I have a glass dish and I drop it on the floor, it's gonna break into a whole bunch of pieces. It was very fragile. Now, if I have maybe like a Tupperware container, I can drop that on the floor and it stays the same shape. However, it doesn't get any better from that stress. If I have a human, so this is a very odd looking stick man here, and human goes to the gym, let's say it does, of course, it's Monday, so human's going to do bench press and bicep curls. Over time, the muscles that were trained are going to get a little bit bigger and a little bit stronger because they've applied a little bit of stress. Obviously, if you go too much, something's gonna break and that's not good, but a little bit of stress, your stick man here, or you in this case, although you don't have to look like a stick man, actually gets better. 
So this top of our container, no matter how many times we drop it, it's not going to get better from the stress. But physiology, with a little bit of stress and the correct dose, actually gets better and more resistant to stress in the future. So can we make your physiology more anti-fragile? That will make you more resilient and increase your ability to handle stress. So one of the terms I like is uh, cockroach fitness, right? Why do cockroaches seem to survive pretty much everything? Can we take the framework of fitness and make it more like a cockroach? Can we make it more anti-fragile? In this picture here, uh, I think this is from the Ukraine. You can see kids going outside like dumping cold water on their heads. Now, if this was in the U.S., you may get some very funny looks if your kids were outside doing this. Uh, but they seem to be enjoying it, right? So, obviously, we've got other components in here that we've got some other great people talking about, uh, such as the impact of cold and heat and stress and water and fluids and everything else, right? So, all of this fits into a framework to become more resilient based on the concept of becoming more anti-fragile. A uh, super quick background on me. I did a PhD in exercise physiology at the University of Minnesota. Uh, my PhD research dissertation was actually on metabolic flexibility. Started that research in 2006. Uh, I've actually presented to DARPA on this, so the Defense Advanced Resource Projects Agency. So the people that are kind of responsible for creating the early ARPANET, or now known as the internet, GPS, a lot of cell phone uh, technology. So I presented to them many years ago now on the use of metabolic flexibility to enhance uh, performance and well-being of soldiers, especially in uh, particular high-stress situations. Do some peer reviews, do some published research. I did a master's in mechanical engineering, biomechanics, and Bachelor of Arts in Natural Science. I have my own business, which is under Extreme Human Performance. I'm an associate professor at the Kerrig Institute for Clinical Neuroscience, primarily doing exercise physiology there. I'm instructor for Rocky Mountain University, certified sports nutritionist, and certified strength and conditioning specialist. So what is really metabolic flexibility? This might be a new term uh, to you. So we're going to give you just a little bit of explanation of what it is and how it fits into this framework. So real simply, the two main fuel sources your body uses are going to be carbohydrates and fat. So metabolic flexibility is how well can you use carbohydrates and how well can you use fat. So the formal definition here is the capacity for skeletal muscle to acutely shift its reliance between lipids and glucose, glucose during fasting or in response to insulin, such as postprandial conditions. So we're looking primarily here at skeletal muscle, so very active tissue in the body, and how is it changing its dependence on lipids, so a fancy word for fats, and also glucose, right? We could use carbohydrates maybe in place of glucose. They're not exactly the same thing, but for our arguments here, they'll be a little bit interchangeable. And this is in response to fasting, right? So a period of time where there's no calories coming in, and this is a response to insulin, which is the main hormone driver here. And then postprandial conditions, which is a fancy word for after you consume food. In this case, a mixed meal, some protein, fats, and carbohydrates. So how well is your body, especially skeletal muscle, able to use fats and use carbohydrates under a variety of different conditions? Hmm, that sounds interesting. We also know that a decrease or loss of this is hypothesized to play a role in various disease processes. So if we increase your metabolic flexibility, not only are we making you more anti-fragile, we're increasing your optionality of different fuels to use, we can increase performance also, and we can decrease the risk of developing some type of pathology or disease. So we can increase your health at the same time. And one of the hallmarks of metabolic flexibility is impaired fat oxidation. So to use fat as a fuel, you have to do two things. You have to break apart the fat molecules, or what's called the triglyceride. 
into glycerol and free fatty acids. And then you have to burn those free fatty acids for fuel. All right, so you have to break something and then burn it. So B and then B. The rate limiting step, so the thing you would want to focus on the most, is the use of fat as a fuel, or what's called fatty acid oxidation. So burning fat as a fuel. And it turns out if you can do this better, you can probably see where this is going, right? You have a fair amount of stored body fat on you. Even very lean athletes have a fair amount of stored body fat. So we're kind of walking around with a fair amount of calories already on our system, even if we are lean individuals. So teaching our body to use this as a fuel source not only can help with health, uh, but if we want to survive for a long period of time with the minimal amount of inputs, it's probably going to be a pretty darn good system to use. Uh, this is something called the crossover effect. And briefly, all it's just saying here is that at rest, we're using minimal amounts of carbohydrates in a healthy individual. We want to be using the maximum amount of fat. However, when we're going to train hard, right, so this is aerobic power, this is just uh, how hard you're doing exercise. If we get up near 100% intensity, we want the ability to use carbohydrates to fuel that high intensity exercise. So it's neither that fat nor carbohydrates are the best fuel. It just depends upon what are you trying to do. So the benefit of fat, like I said, even lean individuals have a fair amount of it to use as fuel. So I mean those processes are running well, which we'll get into. The downside of fat is that you cannot run very high intense exercise off only the use of fat. That's much, much better with carbohydrates. The downside is that stored carbohydrates in the body are limited. They're stored in the form of glycogen in the muscle and in the liver. Uh, and they are much more limited in terms of stored capacity compared to fat. So again, each one of them has a pro fat. We have a lot of fuel already stored. It's great for low to moderate intensity work, but it's not very good at high intensity work. Carbohydrates are literally the almost opposite. Uh, they're probably not the best fuel to use at rest, although we can use them if we had to. They are limited in how much can be stored in the body. But when we use carbohydrates, we can create a high amount of power and intensity when we're doing higher speed, power, weightlifting, those types of exercises. So again, both fats and carbohydrates are good. It just depends upon the context, like what are you doing? So with metabolic flexibility, we want to be able to use fat to the highest degree. We want to still use carbohydrates to the highest degree. And we want the ability to switch back and forth from them depending upon the task involved. So insulin is kind of our leverage point. During high intense exercise, like we just showed, you want to use carbohydrates and insulin will be a little bit higher at that point. Higher levels of insulin will push your body to use more carbohydrates. So insulin is like a fuel selector switch. Lower intensity exercise, we primarily want to use fat as a fuel and we can do this by having lower levels of insulin. If we do things to lower insulin, such as fasting, that'll actually push our body to use more fat as a fuel at that time. So fasting, so are you a penguin? It's kind of a weird question, although I live in Minnesota. Some, sometimes during the middle of Minnesota winters, I actually do wish I was a penguin. Uh, but five months of fasting in king penguin chicks. So they're able to fast for five months, which is kind of crazy. But I wonder how long humans are able to fast. So here's the theory of fasting. It's just a period of time without calories. Hmm. If we're going to try to survive and calories are scarce, maybe we should be pretty good at this fasting thing. Uh, if you sleep, right? Unless you did too much ambient and made bacon and eggs at three o'clock in the morning, 
When you're sleeping, for most people, that is considered a time of fasting. I'm sure you've all heard of the term now intermittent fasting, which has all sorts of different definitions. There's probably even more now. There's a 16 and 8 version. There's a kind of 24 hour version from Brad Pylon, Eat Stop Eat. Uh, Ori Huffmeckler has one of the original, kind of the warrior diet. There's an every other day fast. There's a 5 2 fast. And pretty much every time you turn around, there's another type of fasting. So we're just going to talk in general about the concept of fasting and then uh, what I think is a more preferential approach. So real briefly about fasting is in relation to metabolic health. Uh, fasting is implicated in all sorts of beneficial things from metabolic regulation. Uh, via everything from insulin to satiety hormones, lipids, inflammation. Uh, there's some early data showing benefits with obesity, type 2 diabetes, CVD, right? So cardiac stuff, cancer, and possible changes to the gut microbiome. So it has been shown to do all sorts of different beneficial effects in the body. Now, a lot of that is primarily because, as we said, we're constantly bombarded by food everywhere. And we know that as a population, body composition is not the best place that it could be. Uh, what are some of the other uh, metabolic effects of intermittent fasting? All sorts of different things, All right? So if we look at this little thing, we've got waking and feeding here. So everything from blood pressure changes to melatonin changes, coordination, uh, increased muscle strength. And then in the evening or sleep and fasting, uh, things go the other direction, right? Change in body temperature, deeper sleep, uh, melatonin changes. So fasting is related to all sorts of different metabolic changes across the body. So what is the longest fast? So if you had to, what would be the longest time you could go without food? Now again, this is highly variable. There are definitely cases where someone has had medical issues and has died you know, within a very much shorter period of time than this. But if we look at what was the longest known fast was 1971 was in a 27 year old man. Uh, he did survive on just water and supplements. So this was a medically supervised fast. This is not somebody who just decided not to eat and to see how long they could stay alive. Um, but they went for 382 days and went from 456 to 180 pounds, right? So again, this is a fast. This person did not consume any calories during that time. And obviously they were a very large mammal to start and ended up being a smaller mammal. Again, I'm not recommending that somebody go out and attempt to break this record, um, but it's just to illustrate like what is the longest period of time that we know someone has fasted for and been okay. So one of the things that's interesting about fasting, as we said, if we're trying to teach our body to use fat better as a fuel, that'll allow us to survive better and allow us to thrive and increase our metabolic health. So this is a really cool study. They looked at the effects of prolonged fasting on AMPK signaling, gene expression, uh, mitochondrial, in skeletal muscle from lean and obese individuals. Uh, and this is from 2013. I know there's like a ton of stuff on here, so don't check out too much real quick. And one of the things we hear is that fasting will destroy your metabolic rate. And that's generally not true. Now, it is true if you get into very long periods of fast. Could you see some change on that? Maybe. Um, but it's not really much of a destroyer of your metabolism, quote unquote, as what most people think. Now, again, this was a short term fast. This was for 24 and 48 hours. And they took lean individuals and they compared this in obese individuals. So in both of them, if you look at what's called RER, so resting energy expenditure 
or you know, kind of similar to resting metabolic rate, basal metabolic rate. You know, they can all kind of be used interchangeably. Uh, this was after a meal. They measured it, so they're burning about 1,500 calories. So after a 24-hour fast, about 1,444 and 1,546. Now you can see that it did go up a little bit here at the end of a 48-hour fast, but wasn't statistically significant, so not going to worry about that. We'll just say that's generally a wash, right? So it didn't completely plummet even after 48 hours of no food. Again, we have an obese individual here. What you'll notice is that obese individuals, because they're larger mammals, tend to have actually a higher resting energy expenditure and a little bit of a change at 24 hours and 48 hours. Again, that was statistically significant, but it wasn't massive, right? So not that big of a change overall. Again, if we equate this per free fat mass, Right, because we're comparing a lean versus obese individuals, we've got 29, 28, and 30. So again, no real big difference. We've got 30, 28, and 28. So maybe went down a little bit here again in our obese individuals, but it's really not a huge difference. What's pretty interesting here is a respiratory quotient. So this number tells us how much fat versus carbohydrates our metabolism is using. So if it's closer to 1.0, there's something called RER is very similar. That's primarily all carbohydrates. If it's near 0.7, that's primarily all fat. What we see here in a lean individual is that they were able to downregulate to use fat more effectively as a fuel source. So they went from 0.82 to 0.77. And if we look at the obese individuals, uh, one, they started at a much, much lower rate, which is kind of an issue. We'll come back to that. Uh, they did downregulate a little bit, but it took a longer period of time. And again, they got to kind of a similar number here. So if you are a larger or an obese individual, you may need a longer period of fasting to downregulate to use fat more as a fuel source, right? Because these people, by definition, are a little bit more metabolically inflexible. Again, this is the sheer number of just looking at what's called lipid oxidation, so how much fat are they actually using. Again, what we see here in terms of the sheer number, so it started off after a meal very low at two, and then they went to five, and then they went to 6.6. .6. So the obese individuals started off a little bit higher, but in terms of the sheer number, we're still not able to upregulate quite to the degree that lean individuals were, although they're pretty close. Uh, so glucose oxidation, how much glucose are they using? So the after a meal, this was a carbohydrate meal, we'd expect this to be high. So same meal, these individuals were not able to switch and use glucose as much, even though they were just given a meal that had a whole bunch of glucose in it. And then we see similar numbers after that. So the takeaway from this is that one, fasting for 24 to 48 hours is not gonna wreck your resting metabolic rate. Uh, we do see differences in how well and how fast uh, lean versus obese individuals can downregulate to use fat as a fuel. If you're lean, you're a little bit more metabolically flexible you can use fat much better and you can use carbohydrates much better. Although fasting was a stimulus to teach obese individuals metabolism how to use fat better as a fuel source. So that is some data to show that for intermittent fasting as an intervention for health and to increase the body's ability to use fat, it is beneficial for that. Uh, one of the things if we look at a long periods of time with extreme caloric restriction, uh, one of the main studies on that is the Minnesota Starvation Study. And again, these were conscious objectors to the war. There's been several papers that have been written about this. Uh, the big takeaway is that they severely calorically restricted them and they kept them doing as much work as they did before. 
is if you take somebody's calories and you just plummet their calories, the movement or what's called NEAT, so non-exercise activity thermogenesis, how much they just walk around and twitch and move, tends to plummet also. So in these subjects, they still made them do physical labor, they still made them do walking. So they tried to keep their physical movement high while they were dropping their calories. A reason the study was done was because they wanted to see what were the effects of people coming back as prisoners of war and from concentration camps. What was the effect on uh, metabolism under severe caloric deprivation? And then also what would happen with uh, refeeding after that? Um, so we see lots of uh, physiology changes. I won't go into all of them, um, but I thought this was a very interesting quote. It says, ultimately the data from 32 of 36 precipitation, precipitants uh, were included in the final monograph and tables. Uh, two volunteers broke diet and were ex excused from the experiment. One stopped at various shops for Sundays and malted milks and later stole and ate several raw rutabagas. I've tried eating cooked rutabaga before and that was difficult. I can't imagine getting to the point of being so hungry that raw rutabaga, I'm going to break into a store and steal some. And then others consumed huge amounts of gum and admitted to eating scraps of food from garbage cans. Uh, both also suffered severe psychological distress during the semi-starvation period, resulting in brief stays in the psychiatric ward of the university hospital. So... A big thing that jumped out to me reading these studies was that the psychology side of this was massive in addition to the, the physiology. Um, they had people that would be hoarding uh, pictures of cookbooks and all sorts of crazy stuff, like most of the participants but most of the time talking about food. Um, so definitely worth going back and, and looking at it. And to me, the big takeaway is the psychology side is almost even more interesting than the physiology. So from a physiology standpoint, uh, most of them ended up being okay. Like I said here on the psychology side, a couple of them had uh, some, some issues with that. Uh, but again, you can look into that uh, further. Just wanted to point it out here that in these under extreme cases, that's probably some of the best data that we have. Uh, when you read some of these studies from mechanistic side, you'll see all sorts of crazy letters. Again, the big ones are when we're fasting, we are upregulating something called AMPK. So that is going to be a little bit higher. That's the body's way of trying to get more things broken down to get more calories because we need energy in order to run. When calories are more around, especially protein, we have something called mTOR is upregulated at that point. This is mammalian or mechanistic target of rapamycin. And you can think of AMPK and mTOR kind of on a teeter-totter. If mTOR is up, AMPK is generally down. So fasting is a way to upregulate certain things like AMPK, FOXO, and then mTOR is then downregulated. When mTOR is higher, especially in caloric surplus and higher amounts of protein, especially leucine, AMPK tends to be down. So they're kind of teeter-totter of each other. So fasting as a fuel source, you would assume, this was my assumption going in, that if you're a generally healthy-ish individual, that you can just use fat very good at rest and we don't have to worry about training that. Uh, what we see based on data is that there's extremely high variability on how well people can use fat as a fuel source. So Gadecki in 2000 showed very large individual variability in resting RER, right? So RER like RQ was a way to measure how well they're using fat compared to carbohydrates. So 0.7 here is 100% fat, a 1.0 is 100% carbohydrate. So we got people that are really good at using fat and we have other people that are not very good at it at all. And this even persisted over time. Uh, another study by Helge, same thing, 0.83 to 0.95. So again, very variable. And then another study here, range of RER from 0.82 to 0.97. Uh, some weirdo named Nelson published that one. 
Yes, this was my own research that I'm quoting here. All right, so we have some studies showing that how well people use fat as a fuel source at rest is very individual. Some people are really good at it and some people are just not very good at it at all. So, all right, we're back at our crossover effect here. So some people at rest are really good at using fat, other people not so good. And it turns out that how well you can do fasting, I believe is a good proxy measure for how well you can use fat as a fuel source. Now again, you won't be able to know this 100% for sure until you get maybe some lab testing or you have something called a metabolic cart, uh, which I, I bought one so I can do all sorts of crazy experiments and testing. They are very expensive though, um, but how long you can fast, I think, is a pretty good proxy for your body's ability to use fat. All right, so low-carb diet now, it used to be called a famine. Also, if you get very hangry when you're fasting, probably need to work on fasting a little more and teaching your body to use fat better as a fuel source. So big takeaway, if you are not eating, your body is switching to use more fat. Again, some people are better at that process than other people. But upregulating your ability to fast, not only will it help you survive better if food is scarce, it will also help you thrive by making you more metabolically flexible and teaching your body to use fat better as a fuel source. So again, all of this, if you're looking at body comp, we talk all about this in the flex diet cert, looking at body comp and performance. Uh, and yes, calories do matter. But also what we're doing is that we're taking this resting metabolic rate here. And ideally, you want to shift most of that to be used from fat as a fuel. All right. So what about surviving here for food, right? It, at this point, you've probably figured out that I'm not going to give you a lecture about trying to hunt animals on your own. If you can and you want to learn how to do that, I think that is awesome. Uh, if you want to spend time with wilderness survival, learning how to eat edible plants and everything else, I think that is great. All those things are a benefit. Or maybe you'll just stockpile more stuff or just buy more guns. Um, so again, I think those are definitely viable things in order to survive related to food. Uh, but my outlook and what I wanted to do with this is give you things that I believe are a little bit more useful and have a dual purpose of increasing your body's ability to survive and also thrive at the same time. Now, of course, you could get stuff like this and figure out what to make with only five ingredients and how to make it taste good and stockpile all sorts of dehydrated stuff and maybe tasty MREs. Like, if you ever talked to anyone in the uh, military, I don't know anyone who really likes MREs. Of course, that's one thing. But um, I think we can do something a little bit better. So if we look at what is essential for food... Right, so essential for food, we've got three macronutrients. No, alcohol is not on here. We need a protein and we actually do need fat, right? So if you want to go crazy down this pathway, you can look up something called rabbit starvation, which is when the people were settling the U.S. Uh, had proteins that were too lean. They could not consume enough fat, especially for the high amount of caloric expenditure that they were doing, and they ran into issues, All right? So we know protein is essential. We know we need it for repair of muscle. We need it for essential amino acids to run our body, for all sorts of manufacturing of different things and structures. We also know we need essential fat. Right, the two main essential fats are fish oil, <coughs> which is your EPA and your DHA. Now it is debatable how much we can convert from its parent fat, which is omega-3, but conversion rates probably not that great. How much we can kind of convert back and forth between these two is still a little bit debatable. Um, so big takeaway here, we need some protein for sure. We need some fat especially the essential fats. Electrolytes are also very important. 
right? The main one, especially going back in time, is salt. So salt was used as a preservative and was also included in the diet because that is one of the main electrolytes. Of course, you need all of the electrolytes, but salt by volume is by far and away uh, the biggest one, especially if your environment is changing. So if you're outside and you're sweating a lot, your demand for salt and electrolytes is going to go up quite a bit. Now, you'll notice that carbs are not necessarily essential, but they are tasty and a really good source of calories. Um, so could you do a hardcore ketogenic type diet or modified ketogenic diet and just get rid of all carbohydrates? I think you could, um, but that's not where I would have most people start. Is it an option? Yeah, I think it's an option. Uh, again, I'm more biased to doing fasting more so than a ketogenic diet, but it depends on what you have going on. So again, carbohydrates by strict definition are not essential, uh, but are still useful. And in this, I also threw in uh, multivitamin as very cheap insurance. Uh, they're very shelf stable for a long period of time. They don't take up much room. And it's just, in my opinion, good cheap insurance. Uh, is it required? Maybe not, um, but we'll show you how to do this. So what I like, and I would highly recommend you do, use a service like Chronometer. You can, you can sign up for a free account there. Uh, MyFitnessPal and other ones like that work, but this is my preferred one because most of the nutrient sources have actually been verified. And have you just build your own essential food plan. Now you can put in whatever rules you want for this. Maybe you have refrigeration. Maybe you're going to play with the electricity goes out and you don't have refrigeration uh, want to keep in mind things like nutrients right we're going to focus primarily on proteins and fats and what's cool about chronometer is it'll give you all of this data so if i skip ahead here we'll come back to this um, it'll give you a rundown of vitamins carbohydrates so i was able to hit most of my fiber my iron my calcium vitamin a Maybe a little bit low on vitamin C, but that can be changed. Uh, B12, folate. So I did pretty darn good with it overall. And what I did was for my little rules, I said, I want to limit the number of food choices. I want to keep it as simple as humanly possible. I'm not going to have any refrigeration. And at best, the only thing I could do is have some type of cooking source. So I would have some heat. So that would mean I could heat water and I could heat things to cook them if I had to. And then again, I kind of split that about half and half. And I tried to get it relatively close to something I know that I'm gonna be pretty energy stable on. Now again, for macronutrient breakdown, is this perfect compared to what I normally would be at? No but it's pretty darn good. You'll notice protein is pretty darn high, 146 grams. Uh, right now I weigh about 220. Uh, carbohydrates, uh, I went with a little bit higher. And now again, I can adjust that very easily. I'll show you how. And then fat, a little bit on the lower side. So what I picked was items I know that are nutrient rich that are very stable. So black beans, right? Easily canned, easily drained, easily heated. Uh, sardines. I know sardines are a very high amount of essential fat. I uh, do have some protein in them. I did include coffee because I love coffee. It doesn't take that much room to keep and it's just good. Uh, pink salmon canned and already drained. All right, so salmon we know is very high in those essential fats, EPA, DHA, Again, it's a canned item, so if I had to eat it, I wouldn't necessarily have to heat it. And, you know, went with like five ounces here. And I went with carbohydrate sources. I split between white rice and sweet potatoes. Uh, the reason I went with sweet potatoes is because when I only had white rice, I noticed my nutrient density kind of fell off quite a bit. Uh, so sweet potatoes are one of the most nutrient-dense foods, especially if you look at cost. So potatoes, you probably won't know this, but have a high amount of vitamin C. Now, are they going to be as high as like your citrus fruits? No, but they're going to be pretty darn high. 
and we can keep potatoes for a long period of time just keep them relatively cool and dark so they keep for a long period of time white rice very cheap to keep a huge amount for extra calories again sweet potatoes i only want 10 ounces i could probably bump that up if i wanted to to get a little bit more vitamin c and nutrients white rice just went with two cups uh, for oil, I went with olive oil, uh, just a little bit more polyphenols than coconut oil, but coconut oil works fine too. Uh, just that two tablespoons. Again, if I wanted to increase my fat amount here, I would probably just bump up the total amount of olive oil. So you notice I only have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven items, right? So is this going to be a, an amazing menu that you're going to have all these luxurious meals with if the shit hits the fan? No. But they're not going to take up that much space. They're going to keep for a really long period of time. I can adequately adjust my caloric needs pretty easily by playing around, especially with the amount of white rice and playing around with the amount of fat. So it's easy to change. Not a lot of cooking, no refrigeration. Uh, don't need much going on. If I had to, I could start a fire and get a heat source that way. Again, so I would highly recommend that you just play around with this and chronometer, kind of build out something, try to limit it to a few items, and then keep it to just the essentials. And look at the micronutrient breakdown. And so when I ran this, I got pretty darn close, and I didn't include a multivitamin or anything here either. Um, overall, it was you know pretty pretty darn good, right? So play around with that. I think if by picking a little bit more nutrient dense foods. Uh, you can do it pretty easily and you don't necessarily have to spend the rest of your life buying a whole bunch of MREs and a bunch of other stuff either. All right, so as we wrap up here, our goal is to thrive and be resilient, right? So we're using the anti-fragile model here and looking at maybe the cockroach fitness approach, trying to be as resilient as possible. So in our process of surviving, we've got a breakdown here of something we can use that's still very nutrient dense. And we're also teaching our body how to do fasting so that we will be much better prepared. So here's my protocol on how to actually do fasting if you haven't done it before. So like we said, fasting a period of time, no calories. So I actually, and when you start to do this, you're just gonna pick one day per week. So I like to do that on an off day or a very light training day, right? Uh, again, do not push yourself. Stay within your capacity. <clears throat> We're going to slowly push out our fast once per week. A big key I got from Brad Pineland from his book, Eat, Stop, Eat. Once your fast is done, pretend it never happened. You don't need to track everything per se. You don't need to pretend and have more protein or worry about lost nutrients or any of that kind of stuff. Just keep it really, really simple. So you're gonna track a start and end time. I like people to track their post-fast meal to make sure it's something that's somewhat normal. And that's gonna be about it, All right? So our rules for fasting is just a period of time without any calories. Yes, you could have a one caloric diet drink or black coffee or a sugar-free drink, that's fine. I'm not a big fan of putting butter in your coffee at that point. If you want to do that, that's fine, but I would not say that's def defined as fasting because uh, you still are getting a fair amount of calories then. Again, if that's what you enjoy doing, that's cool, but I would say that's probably not by a strict definition of fasting. So once a week, we're going to take a period of time and we're going to push out how long we're fasting. I find this works great to push out breakfast. So if you ate at 8 p.m. on Sunday night, you normally eat at 8 a.m. Monday, you're gonna push breakfast out until 10 a.m. on Monday, right? So we're doing this just one day per week. So that was a 12 hour fast you did, and now you're at a 14 hour fast. So you automatically are doing 14 hours fasted, right? Because we're taking the advantage of the time that you're asleep. And then over the following week, maybe you push this out to 10, maybe you can go till noon, right? So you're only doing this initially once per week, your goal is to get to a pretty easy 19 to 24 hour fast once per week, all right? Now again, after that, if you wanna get crazy and play around with prolonged fasts or do medical supervision to do that, um, that's up to you. 
But I find most people, if they can just get and do 24 hours at the drop of a hat pretty easily, that is a massive increase in the body's ability to survive, body's ability to use fat as a fuel. And if you do get into playing with longer periods of fasting, um, I find that getting to that first 24 hour period is usually the hardest. Now again, longer periods of fasting will definitely still be harder. Uh, we can debate if they're useful or not. But I think as a baseline, a good kind of happy medium, I like most people to be able to do 24 hour fast pretty darn easy. Now the advantage we have in times like now is it's a controlled stress, right? So just like training in the gym, we're training your metabolism to switch to use fat and to get used to fasting. After you've hit this 24 hour mark, if you wanna go to the next level, then I would say do all your normal training and do all your normal tasks that you would and make sure that your performance is still good. Now, most of the time it's gonna be pretty darn good. So now you have the ability to go 24 hours and really not see any drop off of anything else. And I think that is a huge advantage. So not only now are you not necessarily dependent on survival for food all the time, I think you'll learn a lot about yourself in the process. You'll learn a lot about food cues, what you're really hungry. Are you really hungry? Are you not hungry? Um, and for example, I've recorded this completely fasted. Uh, last time I ate was 8 p.m. Uh, last night. It's about 12.30 right now and still doing pretty good. So that's my bias of the best way to survive and to thrive, to become more resilient in time using the model of anti-fragile fasting and try to be a little bit more like a cockroach to be more resilient in all cases. So thank you so much for listening to this. Greatly, greatly appreciate it. Um, if you are interested, uh, this is based on concepts that are in the Flex Diet certification. Uh, Flex Diet, again, is primarily designed for better body composition and performance and health at the same time. It was initially written for trainers and coaches, but we've had probably almost a 50-50 mix of trainers and coaches and just fitness enthusiasts that have gone through it. So it's eight interventions you'll get in nutrition and recovery, everything from fasting to NEAT to exercise to protein, fats, carbohydrates, micronutrition, sleep, all sorts of fun stuff. Each, week, each time you get a big picture. So what is the framework of flexible dieting and metabolic flexibility? You get a one hour technical primer on each one of the interventions. So say everything you wanted to know about protein or carbohydrates, and that's condensed down into only about one hour. So you don't have to sit through eight hours of me yammering about protein. And then we have five action items that you can use for each intervention. So we put it into a complete system that you can take each one of those, you know what item to start with, you know the background, the context, and how to apply it. And then I've also have um, some expert interviews in there too from friends of mine who are researchers in the area. Everybody's from like Dr. Stephen Guinette to Dr. Dan Party, Dr. Stu Phillips on protein, Dr. Jose Antonio, Eric Helms, Peter Fitzson, all sorts of great people if you want to take that deeper dive. So you can check that out. Just go to www.flexdiet.com. Uh, if it's open, you'll be able to hop in right away. If not, just add your name to the wait list there and we'll let you know the next time that it opens. So uh, thank you very much. If there's anything else I can do to help, uh, best way to reach me is through the newsletter there and just hop on and drop me a note. So thanks again. I greatly appreciate it. We've got a whole bunch of extra or additional references here if you want to check into the effects of fasting, uh, metabolism, and everything else. We'll find a way to get those to you. So thanks again. Greatly appreciate it.